So now that we know, as we've been talking about in these, these videos, guys, is that certain varieties of figs, these are all different varieties of fig trees, certain varieties require different levels of light. And I think it's something really worth talking about, how that it really affects my criteria of the varieties that I'm looking at. Because we've talked about in the past a lot, we've touched on what varieties are really specifically good for this particular climate. And that usually involves, it has involved, fruit quality. So when we look at a variety here, we, we're judging them based on a set of criteria. We think about things like drying capabilities or split resistance or the fact that it doesn't crack a lot, the fact that it ripens at an earlier date, the fact that it has a shorter hang time. All these things contribute so much in a positive way to better fruit quality here in a humid or rainy climate. And that can go for a lot of us throughout the country. That's a really great set of criteria that I've given you guys over the years. But we haven't really touched a ton on productivity. And I've always been uh, of the opinion that our fig trees just do not, it's not really wise, I should say, it's not smart to judge the productivity of our fig trees based on their age. It really takes them a number of years before they come into their own and you can really make a solid um, estimation on how productive the fig tree actually is. Uh, but I've found something really interesting here this year in regards to light that I think is really worth changing my criteria for which I judge all of these varieties on and it really is revolved around productivity. And there's many definitions of productivity. There's many ways of thinking about it. And I'm not really even totally sold on really my final definition of productivity, but maybe you could define it as really the amount, the sheer amount of figs that a fig tree could produce. Or you could define it and involve the weight. Maybe there's a final weight or something that you're looking for, or you know, it's not just the amount of them, but they also need to be of a larger size. Um, so the criteria though, that really determines, I think, how many figs a tree can produce, not necessarily the sheer weight of the fruits, but it definitely in terms of the amount can be really well depicted this year in my yard uh, amongst these trees. And if you know anything about what we've been doing the last really the last few weeks since the season began with these fig trees is that we've been really diligent on giving them a lot of light opening up the center of the tree giving them the the sunlight penetration and maximization that they need to set fruits really there's a bare minimum amount of light that is required for every single variety to actually set fruits and believe it or not i've learned that every variety of course is different, right? I mean, that's been known for, since I uh, really got heavily into this. We learn everything we grow, we learn more about different genetics, not just of these plants, but how it relates to us as humans. We're all very, very different and our genes really determine a lot of those differences. So if we have a fig tree, let's say, that was grown in an area for many, many years that didn't get a lot of sun, or maybe the sunlight wasn't that intense and it's adapted there, it's evolved, really. I mean, that's essentially it, how it works and how these plants change over time. It has become accustomed to putting out fruits because the, the fig tree and every plant, they wanna flower, right? They wanna reproduce. So eventually they've kinda of changed their genes in a sense to adapt to those conditions and Certain fig trees just have, over time, adapted to these particular climates, to these particular low light environments. And what you then end up having, or you even have the opposite, by the way. So you have some varieties that have, that have adapted to these higher light conditions and can't withstand those lower light conditions. And I think my yard really does a great job of depicting that, oddly enough, because you know, not only am I in an area, oddly, it's really so strange that we, we have some fig trees every year that can survive and some that will die. 
You know, so this is a good area in a sense for testing hardiness because we're right on that edge of dying or surviving every year. It's the same thing with the amount of light I get back here. We have so many shade trees and, and things that you can, you know, even right now, it's, it's not even uh, 630 yet in the evening. And um, the sun is not even shining here. In fact, I would argue that this bed here and really all my patio and almost every single area that I'm growing fruit on this property really doesn't get any much more than eight hours of light. If that, this area here maybe gets seven or eight hours. I have some much shadier areas over there that get only five or six. Some over there, I have fig trees planted over there that get only six or seven. Um, the west side only gets about seven hours of light. So we're in an, in an area that isn't California, isn't the south. Uh, our sunlight isn't very intense. But we do have very long days here, and I'm just not making good use of those long days. We get, by the way, I looked it up today, I think it's like we have 15 hours of daylight right now. 15 hours, and I'm only making use of direct light for like seven or eight of that, for only half the day, which is just mind blowing, the difference. Even the crops that I grow here in the garden, these are my tomatoes, to my left and the community garden that I joined this year, the sheer amazing, incredible difference between the community garden and how everything grows there compared to here is just like night and day. It is night and day and it's not even the soil. It's just the sheer number of daylight hours. This is getting half the amount of light that the community garden gets. So it's just incredible, I think. It's, it really is astounding just looking at the community garden to this, but I've also gone around and now that I've learned about this particular important thing of the light and how it affects the fruit set, I've been very careful in observing not just my own trees, but trees in other places. Um, I have gone out of my way to really try to evaluate other trees and see what their fruit set is like um, in these other areas figuring out how much light they have um, and seeing really what the big differences are. And what I've really what I've learned, as I said, is that every variety is different. And one of the things that we can really determine, how we can really determine how one variety might be more productive than the other, or let's say put out more fruits than the other variety, is really how low of a light condition it is adapted to. If you have a variety that is adapted to very low light conditions, maybe six or seven hours of light, and it will fruit heavily, uh, if you put that variety in, let's say, an area that gets 15 hours of light or 10 hours of light, it's gonna be insanely more productive in the sense of this. So let me th let's think about it this way, is that every single tree here, I have, thinned the shoots. We cut them back to six to 12 inches every single season in the fall. I make so many cuts. By the way, they're gonna be taller than me uh, very soon. It's amazing, we're not even in July and they've just taken off. Um, but you know, what I've, been, what I've been, what I'm getting at here is that when we cut them back like that, they love to re-sprout and they send out a lot of shoots in every which way. So what we have to do to get the light that we we need to get them to set the fruits is we have to thin out the shoots. So every variety here, every tree maybe has put out in the past 10, 15, 20 shoots. And I had to come in here and limit that to four. I've limited each and every shoot to four per tree. If you can imagine that every tree has a box and the box is about two square feet. A two square feet box, that's the amount of space that every tree is given. They're spaced two feet on center. I have three rows of fig trees going down this way. It's about 20 feet long, six feet wide. So if every tree is given two square foot, if you do the math and you have four fruiting branches, four shoots that I allow to grow, well, that means that each individual shoot gets one square foot of the box. If you do that, you're gonna have great success. Even in my lower light condition 
areas here, my, my yard, you're gonna have great success with fruit set. It worked out fantastic. However, there are varieties that I'm noticing are exceptionally better at setting their fruits in these lower light conditions than other varieties. As I said, some are more adapted, some are not. So one of them here that is just fantastic, I, I can't believe how good this one is, it's called St. Martin. And the thing has fruits, every single leaf on the tree represents a fruit, which is how it should be, which is how a lot of you guys probably have your fig trees. But that's not always been the case for me. Um, I also have a variety up here called Neruccio de Elba that also has fruits from bottom of the branches all the way to top. There's uh, many different examples I could show you in here. This one here, uh, Violet Sapor, we have La Magdalene does really well. We have uh, Borges Soak Grease. We have um, uh, some back there like the Pastelier and the, and the Violet de Bordeaux are doing a bit better with these better light conditions that they've been giving now that I have opened up the center. But we also have the opposite. The opposite is very true in that some of the varieties that are not well adapted to this amount of light, like Colonel Lippmann's Black Cross, we have the, the Dow Oso, we have Smith. Um, there are certainly varieties back here that just are not getting the amount of light that they need. And because of that, they're not setting their fruits and they probably will never set their fruits. What is it, today or tomorrow? If today's the 21st of June, one of these days is the longest day of the year. So from this point on, we're getting less light. We're getting less light. There's nothing I can do now to give these trees more light because we've already achieved the most amount of light that we're gonna get uh, this entire growing season. So if they're not fruiting at this point, they're probably not gonna fruit. It's, uh, it's probably a, a goner for them. And, and they are just gonna probably grow all season and that's, that'll be it for them. Uh, so it's a shame. Um, it really is, but, um, you know, this is really giving me an eye-opening experience. So it's not all a loss, right? I'm, not, I'm upset, obviously, that some of these trees are not fruiting. I've done all I could, I've used all the ounces of knowledge I have, the years of experience I have growing these fig trees, and they're still not fruiting. You know, that's upsetting, but now I know that I'm banging my head against the wall. That's why, coming back to this, the whole lesson of this video is that we need to change our criteria of the varieties that we choose. It's not just enough to have good fruit quality because if they're not producing, what's the sense in having good fruit quality, right? So a variety like Colonel Lippmann's Black Cross, it just is not meant for anyone, I believe, in a very low light environment. If you're not getting at least eight hours of light and you know, here's the other caveat, guys. Eight hours of light, well, where are you? Are you in the south? Are you in the north? The south, the further south you go, the more intense the light is. The further north you go, the longer your days are. But it's less intense. So I think that's how it works. So the point is, is that, you know, eight hours of light is a general recommendation, but it's not even a great recommendation. The point is, I think, Particular varieties I have should not be grown here, um, at least in my yard. Maybe someone five minutes down the road is having great success with this variety, or Smith, or Colonel Edmonds Black Cross, or the Dow Oso, and I'm sure they will. I, I don't think it has anything to do with this area, a macro sense. It has everything to do with, guys, my microclimate, the amount of light that I get here on my property, and that's it. So who's to say, and here's where we're getting to the productivity of this, who's to say that, well, Colonel Lippmann's Black Cross or Smith isn't productive? Because if you had it in a field that was getting 10 hours or 12 hours of light a day, or light from morning till sundown, uh, who's to say it wouldn't be very productive? But here's my, my other point is that varieties here like Neruccio de Elba, I forgot to mention this, we limited every single tree 
to four fruiting branches per tree. Some of them I've realized I could probably get away with if I'm, if I'm really careful with them, I could probably get away with having multiple fruiting branches, more than the four. Um, so I've limited some to five, I've limited some to six. I think you can even get away with seven in this particular spacing here. I think it's possible. There are some varieties that are just so well adapted and as they become more mature, they're gonna do better and better. There's a tree actually I looked at uh, at the Jersey Shore. It's uh, right off the beach, beautiful Celeste. I actually got myself a, a sucker. I dug up a sucker, brought it home. I got it in a pot right now. Uh, it is so insanely productive, that tree in terms of the sheer amount of fruits it puts out. And I looked at it, the shadier parts of the tree obviously are not getting the fruit set that you would expect. But I also was blown away because a lot of the fruiting branches were so close together. They're not anywhere near the distance that I have these branches. One square foot, that's insane. One square foot on that tree, uh, the branches are like, some of them are like, three to four inches apart. It's, uh, it's incredible. What some varieties can really withstand and have adapted to over time. Um, so a variety like Neruccello de Elba, I can get away with maybe five, six, seven fruiting branches on it. Maybe that Celeste that I saw can get away with multiple fruiting branches, more than the standard four fruiting branches that I have here on some of these trees. And therefore, because I have more fruiting branches, that's the point, I have more fruiting branches, I therefore should have more fruits. Every fruiting branch potentially puts out however many leaves it is. Let's say it's 10, 15 leaves. So if I have four fruiting branches and each fruiting branch has 10 fruits on it, that's 40, 40 fruits. But if I had a variety like Neruccio de Elba, that had six fruiting branches and it had 10 fruits, then you're looking at 60. So my production has gone up 50%. You see what I'm saying? And that, that is really, I think, the true definition of production. That a variety that is so well adapted to lower light conditions, kind of like that Celeste tree that I saw, that even at its huge size, and lots of internal shading that the tree had uh, been subjected to just due to its natural habit, um, it has essentially put out a ton of fruit in a given area. That's really, I guess, the only way to really describe it is, you know, how much fruit in a given space can that particular fig tree produce? And then, of course, you may have to start thinking about weight, as I mentioned. So it's not just enough to think about the sheer number of the fruits, but also the weight. So what you're really looking for, the super, super productive variety, is a variety that's well adapted to lower light conditions, that will put out many fruiting branches, still attain the amount of light that it needs to fruit on those fruiting branches, like a Celeste, like a Nebruccio de Elba, like a Hardy Chicago, and then also produces a large fig. So the one variety I think that's coming to my mind that fits that category, because Neruccio de Elba is very small, Celeste is very small, Hardy Chicago is a smaller fig. The one variety here that I think is really probably a super, super, super productive variety, no matter where you plant it, is actually Borges Oak Reese. Violet support. These two trees, I, I think, I believe are roughly the same thing, if not the same thing. And they have great adaptability, uh, adaptations, I should say, to these lower light conditions that I'm in. The fruits form here on these trees, guys, all the way down here at the bottom, all the way to the top. They have fruits forming right now. It's a mid season fruit, they're not too late. Um, it's ex extremely vigorous as well. So it should put out a lot of growth, a lot of fruits. And the fruit size, by the way, 
is, uh, you know, mid-size. It's about a 50 gram or so-ish fig, which is pretty good for commercial potential. I think it even has commercial potential. So at least that's how I'm viewing now this whole thought process on productivity. I think there's a lot of refining that needs to be done. I still need to think about this a bit more, organize my thoughts a bit more, but um, it makes a lot of sense to me that I would rather have a variety that's, I, I think inevitably, a variety that is well adapted to lower light conditions will just inevitably be more productive than something that requires more light. And it doesn't matter, I think, where you live. I think even if you lived in, you know, the equator or something, and you had light all day, or whatever it is, you lived in Alaska and you had light all day, all long, all day long, um, you know, you're still gonna have the varieties, by the way, that are adapted to those lower light conditions. They're gonna put out more fruiting branches that are then gonna be able to carry more fruit. And you're just gonna have a thicker canopy of fruiting branches rather than having maybe a lot of these vigorous shoots that have to be further apart away from each other, taking up more space and producing less fruits in a given area, right? I think it, I, hopefully, hopefully it's making sense for a lot of you guys. It's hard to comprehend. Um, you know, and I'm not really explaining it that well, but you know, so I think you guys got it. And uh, we'll talk more about this as we go on. It, it cer certainly isn't done. I thank you guys for joining me. I thank you guys for getting to this point. And uh, if you did, you learned something, you enjoyed this, hit that subscribe button. We'll see you for the next one, all right? Take care, guys.